we have uh, Roger Payne here from Johns Hopkins. And uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Ian and Randy for inviting me to this uh, very interesting workshop. And um, so I'm come from, coming from the Department of Biostatistics at the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. Uh, it's the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> and um, for, so two, two questions that I, I just kind of want to put out there that I've been thinking of recently. And um, well, one's a question, one's a statement. The first is, you know, what if you were to be given a research article or, you know, something from some journal, you know, what, situa what framework or kind of what would satisfy you uh, that the research is reproducible uh, short of actually going in and reproducing it yourself? You know, so what kinds of things would convince you that a certain person's or an article was in fact reproducible if you weren't able to physically go in there and, um, and, you know, and reproduce things yourself? So, for example, what statements could the authors make or what could they make available or what, you know, things like that. So. Um, that, so I think that's something that I've been kind of thinking about in terms of, you know, what can we, what, in terms, if someone asks you, how do I make my work reproducible, what do you answer them? So, um, the, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, in, uh, one of the things that I've kind of been thinking about a little bit is that one issue that comes up a lot in certain areas of research, particularly areas that are kind of more controversial than others, uh, I don't work in a particularly controversial area, but there are sometimes controversies, um, is that, you know, when your research is reproducible, uh, very often there are, there are people who do not necessarily hold themselves to the same standards, perhaps, as you do or all of us would, and, and, um, and therefore kind of do not feel compelled to follow any of those same rules that we might feel compelled to follow in terms of scientific conduct. And so when your work is out there, there's an enormous possibility for t people like this to take advantage of and to, to advantage of what you've made available and to, and to essentially you know, make your personal life miserable. So uh, that, I think, is a huge disincentive for a lot of people to uh, make your work reproducible, if only because it just takes up a lot of your time to have to deal with. So I mean, what I'm thinking of, so I particularly work in the area of air pollution research. In the US, you know, air pollution regulation is a huge, um, is a huge field and costs industry billions of dollars every time you know, EPA lowers the standard by 10 micrograms per meter cubed or something like that. And so, any, so research that supports the idea that certain industries are killing people is, can be controversial. And, um, and there are often, and, and it is in the interest of these industries to, to um, can refute or to, not refute is the right word, but just challenge any of the work, that any research that comes out. And so, uh, you know, I've been in a number of situations, who, and I'll talk about a little bit later, where, you know, our research has been reproducible, and people have, have used that data to essentially make up analyses, and we have evidence that they were essentially made up. So their work was not reproducible, but they don't hold themselves to the same standard. And, and at this point, it, it's true that even if, there, I think even if it were reproducible, it wouldn't have necessarily mattered in terms of the debate. Um, and, um, and it just, you know, it didn't really affect my career or anything. It just uh, made, you know... This, it just adds to the long list of things that I need to deal with every day. So um, anyway, that's just the comment. So one thing I want to straighten out very quickly is that so Andrew and I have the complete opposite definitions of replication and reproducibility. So what I call replication, he calls reproduction, and what I call reproducibility, he calls replication. So, I just, so in case you you know you weren't confused already, now is the time, right? So is that? Okay. So. What I call replication now, and, and, and partly this is because I think w when I was thinking about these ideas, the, idea, the word reproducibility was kind of out there already. So, um, and so what I call replication is really the, the idea, this idea of, you know, you see some published, uh, a scientific claim is out there, X causes Y or whatever, and, um, and you go get your own data. You're a different person. You go get your own data. You use, you know, different methods perhaps, different laboratory, different instruments, whatever it is. And, uh, but you address the same kind of scientific question and you come up with a result that's consistent, uh, probably not exactly identical, uh, but is ne nevertheless consistent. And I think this idea, I, 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 many people, including myself, find this to be a very strong form or strong support for any kind of scientific claim. If, you can, if an independent person can, can, um, can come up with a consistent result, that's very strong evidence. Um, and I think it's particularly uh, important, replication is particularly important in studies that can have broad kind of policy or regulatory decisions. Um, so why do we need reproducible research now? So reproducibility, 
uh, is the idea that you take some, the same data that someone else generated and apply their method, their same methods, and, and, and hopefully their code, um, and, and get the same results. So that's the reproducibility. So why do we need reproducibility? So many studies cannot, this simply cannot be replicated. So for example, there may be no time. Some studies are, are, are opportunistic. So uh, one area I think it was, you know, so like during the Olympics, you know, they shut down all the factories. So there's like all these air pollution studies that occur right around the Olympics every four years. But you can't really replicate that. I mean, the Olympics, that, that particular set of Olympics will not occur again. And so, um, and so some are just opportunistic like that. Uh, usually there's no money to replicate a huge uh, epidemiologic study or, you know, to like recruit all these people again. Uh, and some studies are just simply unique. They look at a unique population, and by definition, a unique population you know, doesn't exist somewhere else. So, um, um, so that's so th those are three. So that's one main reason that the studies can't be replicated. Uh, there are a lot of new technologies um, in many different areas. Not just I mean, people think of genomics, but there's many areas where um, uh, we increase increase the data collection throughput, so we can collect a lot of data for roughly the same price that we were able to collect a lot less data before. Uh, these data are very high dimensional, they're complex. Um, and furthermore, different databases are out there that be, can be merged to make the kind of mega databases. That's essentially what all of my research involves doing that. Um, and on top of that, I mean, these are all related, of course, but computing power is greatly increased. Uh, you can do a much more sophisticated analysis at the push of a button. Um, and, um, and many times you don't necessarily understand what the analyses are doing. Um, and generally, you know, I've heard this, this is uh, from Jan Deleu, the chair of statistics at UCLA. He said, you know, for every field X, there is now a computational X. And so, um, and the idea is that, you know, you can do a lot of science without having, you know, so there, you, know, you can do a lot of biology without looking at a microscope. And you can do a lot of astronomy without looking at a telescope. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of examples of this kind of um, work. Um, and so, uh, my cartoon of the current state of affairs is that you can either have full replication by just doing your own study, or that's it, right? And so how do we bridge this gap is kind of what I'm interested in. Because, um, you know, for replication, you don't need anything. You just need your own resources, right? You don't need the other person to cooperate with you necessarily. So uh, my cartoon of the kind of research pipeline, that I, uh, what I call it, is the idea is that, so you see an article in the journal, and you are the reader. And, uh, but in reality, there's all this stuff that kind of went into it, right? So the author went through a long process to generate this article uh, that is published in the journal. And, um, and, my, and the, I kind of broken it down to a few rough categories. So there's some measured data that they got from nature, from people, from whatever they were measuring. So sorry, to interrupt, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, Mark, our video oh, guy yes. just said that it's a good idea to use the pointer on your laptop so that you can capture it. So, so, so don't right. literally point. OK. Well. <laughs> Right, so there's, uh, there's measured data uh, that we, you, know, you get from nature. Um, there's maybe some enormous, there's often an enormous amount of processing code uh, that results in what I would call analytic data. So this is, analytic data is kind of nice data that you might feed into like a statistical analysis program. You want to do, you want to compare two means or you want to do a regression or something like that. So that's the, and then so that's analytic data. Then there's analytic code that kind of generates some computational results. So these results might be p-values or a list of p-values or a regression coefficient or something like that. Um, and then there's, and there may be some code to create figures and tables and or other numerical summaries. And then you kind of combine all this with some text and make an article, right? So I mean that's roughly that's my cartoon of how you know this works. Um, one thing I've, I've discovered more recently is that many, especially in epidemiology, I find many people do not think that um, these parts of the kind of research process are all that important, in the sense that all of the important decisions are made kind of uh, before um, this measured data box, right? So any decisions you made about the protocol for research, or what types of variables you're going to measure, what uh, questions you're going to ask, uh, uh, you know, what subpopulations, you know, all these kinds of th the things you do decide before you conduct the research are the most important questions. I mean, I've heard, I've heard this a lot. And I, I disagree, obviously. I think, I think all the kind of work that you do after that is also key, key, uh, critically important. So if you made it available, that would, uh, that would, be, that would, that would still be very important rather than, say, um, just kind of being, so being able to kind of do your, implement your own protocol. So for example, in many clinical trials, the protocol is secret. It's considered proprietary. Um, and, um, but, and so I've heard a lot so that, you know, that you know, what we really need is the protocol. You know, what, what did they intend to measure? You know, did, did they measure eight outcomes, only publish one? You know? And so, um, but I, so I disagree. I think all of this is important, not just the kind of pre-measured data stuff. So, um, 
So about five years ago now, uh, uh, my colleagues Francesca Domenici and Scott Zeger and I published a commentary in the American Journal of Epidemiology uh, about reproducible epidemiologic research. And the idea is that um, you know, epidemiology as a field does not have a culture of reproducibility at all, as far as I can tell. And, um, but there are certain areas, in particular, I was, you know, I was working in the area of air pollution research where uh, reproducibility um, can, be, can, have, can, have, can be very important. And in particular, because many air pollution studies just simply cannot be replicated. They're hugely expensive. And so, um, and so the idea, so we try to kind of bring this idea out into the epidemiology literature and, we, and propose like a little kind of definition and, uh, and a couple of other cute ideas. But um, anyway, so that was five years ago. And, um, and the basic rationale for, for this area was that you know, air, there's, there's three things that kind of con, uh, conspire to make reproducibility very important in air pollution research. One is that you're estimating a very small health effect. So air pollution is not something that knocks you over in the middle of the street. Right? It's something that over large populations and over long periods of time you see the effect. But it's not, so, it's not, a, it's not the number one killer out there. Right? So it's a very small effect. Uh, the, any results that we publish can have very substantial policy decisions, particularly with EPA regulation. Uh, and also, we use, relatively speaking, complex statistical methods um, to estimate you know, these health effects from epidemiological data. And so uh, when you combine the three things together, it, it can, it, the things can be, it, it kind of conspires to, make, to, to generate this need for reproducibility. Um, so one of the things that we did in this, effort, in this direction was create this internet-based health and air pollution surveillance system, which is basically, it's a website, it sounds fancy, but it's a website that essentially published our data it published our, uh, uh, some of our software, and, uh, and you know, we posted links to our publications. So, um, and, it's been, and it's been used quite a bit. I don't have specific statistics about how much it's been used, but, we've, but I do see papers published in the literature that use the data. Um, and so um, uh, the, the usefulness, of that, that's the usefulness for this particular website is kind of decreasing over time because the data set ends at the year 2000, and so now it's already you know, 11 years old. So. Um, but, uh, but some people still do use it, um, in, in particular these industry folks who love to use it a lot. So, um, so the, the kind of definition that we came up with just to kind of have something in this, uh, it was that basically that the, if you think of that kind of framework that I have, the analytic data are available, uh, so not the measured data necessarily, uh, the analytic code uh, and the documentation of the code and the data and, and using some sort of standard means of distribution. Right? And so, um, um, so, and the, and the basic idea is we assume that there are, uh, and so the framework assumes that there are two types of people. One is that there's authors uh, who want to make their research reproducible. So I kind of condition on that first. So I'm not trying to convince anyone at this point. So we assume the authors want to make their research reproducible and they want some tools to make their lives easier, to make it possible to do this. So for, you know, and, uh, and there are now many tools out there, I think, for helping people do this. Um, uh, there are readers who want to reproduce certain findings or maybe expand upon certain interesting findings, and they also want tools uh, to make their lives easier. Right. So some of the challenges are, right now, I mean, especially the less computationally oriented uh, researchers out there have to undertake considerable effort to put their data and their results to either on the web or somewhere where other people can access them. Uh, and very simply, you know, many people do not have access to web, a web server or maybe or would have to, have to pay for hosting you know, their data you know, for in perpetuity. And so uh, these resources may not be available. Um, now, and uh, even when things like that are available, uh, readers have to download the data and the results uh, kind of individually, kind of piece them together. If you've ever been to like a supplementary materials website, it's just like a bunch of links, right? And so you have to kind of get everything and collate it all. Um, and, and, and also critically, I think, in, particularly I think now in genomics, but also some of the work I do, you know, many of the people reading your work do not have the same resources that you do. Uh, if you generated the research. And so, how, and so it may not be reproducible in that sense just because you can't run it. Um, and so in the reality is that authors all, if they, they will often just kind of put stuff on the web, throw it up there without any sort of organization. Or there's journal supplementary materials. Um, there are some central databases for kind of field specific data. So things like uh, uh, Geo or Array Express or things like that. Um, and then readers just trying to download it and figure it out, right? And then piece the software together they need to run it. Um, so one idea that I'm kind of building on is this idea of literate statistical pro programming. So this is, comes from the literate programming idea, which is that, you know, so here you think of an article as a stream of text and code. Um, there's analysis code that has, you know, it analyzes the data or does something with data. Uh, and those are chunks, and then there's uh, each code chunk kind of does something with the data. Uh, and there can be presentation code that kind of formats results. 
And then there's text kind of all around that which um, explains what's going on, presumably. Uh, and these literate uh, statistical programs can be kind of weaved to produce a, um, a, uh, a human-readable document and tangled to, pr to produce a machine-readable document. So this all comes from this you know, idea of Don Canute. Right? So, um, and so the literate... Uh, so the literate programming concept requires two things. One is a documentation language and a programming language. Uh, and so there's one uh, particular package, in, uh, so I should have mentioned that, that I'm going to be talking mostly about the R uh, statistical kind of analysis environment. Um, and, um, and so there's one particular package called Sweeve which uses LaTeX as its uh, documentation language and R as its programming language. So, and it was developed by Fritz Leisch um, and it has a nice website. And there are other kind of combinations that you can use. And so, so one thing that I was interested in doing is taking, okay, is taking the kind of definition that we had of having analytic data and computational result and analytic code and say, okay, well, let's take the process here. Uh, presumably, the article is you know, available because it's in a journal. Um, and then we, let's make this part available too. The idea is that we'll, we'll kind of store these things in some sort of database of, uh, of, of sorts and then make it available to the reader. So the reader kind of wants to go this direction. They want to take the article and dig in. And, articles, and authors are kind of taking their data and they're going that way. They're producing articles. And so um, the idea is to take these kind of aspects of the, uh, of the work and kind of store them in a database to make, make it available to readers. So uh, in the kind of literate statistical program framework, you have like your paper here, which is, uh, has text and code and text and code. You take the code chunks and you store their results. So the code chunks kind of do something with the data. You store the results in the code in some, central, in some database. Make that a, you publish essentially the database part along with the paper. Um, and, so, and then this is the paper here, which, which uh, is generated. So you generate the figures and the tables for, and the, uh, and the, from the material stored in the database. Um, so, that's, so, I, so, that this, so we came up, there's kind of two packages that we have. One is uh, this is called Cache Sleeve, which is for I won't talk about today, but it's, it interacts with Sweeve. And the other one is called Cacher here, which is a standalone package. Um, and the idea is that it, it, so it, it assumes that you have some code in an R file. And, um, and it basically, it, it kind of reads your code, evaluates it, and stores the results in, in a kind of a key value database. So, so the R expressions, so the code expressions, are all given kind of a SHA-1 hash value so that the, so if there are any changes, that you know, they can be tracked uh, and code can be reevaluated necessarily. And the idea is that you kind of put everything, the code and data, um, uh, in, a, in a package that you could just give to someone, right? And we call this, I call this a cache or package. So the other people can kind of, can get the analysis called clone or clone the analysis uh, and look at subsets of the codes or inspect specific data objects. So the, and one assumption that I've made is that other people do not necessarily have the resources that you have. And so they may not want to run the entire Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation that you did to get the, you know, posterior distribution or the histogram you've got at the edge. So they might just want to look at specific end products uh, of that, or, and then maybe when, when they see the end products, they say, oh, well, you know, actually, maybe I do need to look at the whole MCMC. So, but the idea is that you, know, you kind of peel the onion a little bit rather than just go straight to the core, right? So, um, and so the model is basically that you have some code source file, there's code that goes in, there's data that goes in, and out comes results, right? So, um, so as an author, the idea of cache is that it kind of parses the source file, uh, it creates uh, directories and subdirectories for storing things. Um, and then it evaluates exp each expression. And, so, and also, if you run it multiple times, if, it, if an expression hasn't changed, um, it won't run it again. So it, kind of, it just load the kind of, it, it, as it runs expressions, it caches the results of the database. So if you run it again and then nothing's changed, you just kind of load the results back from the database. Um, and then it writes out a bunch of metadata for each expression. And so, and, the, and then once, it, that's, once you've kind of evaluated your whole analysis, and granted this might take a long time, um, everything, all the kind of intermediate results are stored in the database, and, um, and you can kind of wrap that up into a package. So that's the idea here um, at, with this cache package function. Uh, and this, it basically, it just it becomes a zip file, a, zip, a package, and it can be kind of distributed to others. Um, so that's kind of what happens as an author here. Um, and so a very simple analysis, you know, you're, you're loading some packages, you're loading a data set, you fit some simple linear model, um, and then you might, maybe you want to summarize what the, what the fit was, look at the regression coefficients, things like that. Uh, and then you make a plot here. So here you're just plotting some diagnostics here. So the idea is that any, any expression that kind of has, that does something, uh, then the results of that something are stored in the database. If an expression doesn't do anything, like maybe it just prints something to the console, then, it, then nothing is stored. 
creates a variable or, or modifies a variable. Or right. So in R, if something is created in the environment, then that is stored. Okay. Perfect. Yes. The figure, so yeah, right. So we don't store the figure itself, right? Um, and then the idea is that the package would have a, an identifier like SHA-1 here, and um, and then so the idea is you could say if you were writing an article, you could say well everything in this article can be found in this package, and here's the identifier string. So it's ugly, but you know you can just use the four, you can use the first four uh, characters, and that's usually enough to identify um, the, the package itself. So on the reader side, then, if you're reading something like this in a journal, you could say, okay, well, I'll take this, I'll take the string, and maybe I don't want to read the whole thing, but I'll just get the first four characters out, uh, and you can clone the whole thing, right? And so, and and um, I'll get to the where it comes from later, but um, and the idea is that you can see, so you can clone it, you can see what files uh, were cached there, um, and um, and then kind of go through the analysis. So uh, some local directories are created, the source code files and the metadata are downloaded, but the data themselves are not downloaded initially. Right, because it could be a lot, right? You know, and so that's not done by default. Um, and, but references to the various data objects that have been created are loaded, so that if you know, so the idea is that these are lazy loaded into the environment. Once you want to look at something, then it gets downloaded into your uh, into your onto your computer. Um, and so the idea is you can look at the code. Um, and so this is just some simple analysis that I've done. Uh, you can make a graph of the code. Um, so this uh, takes all the data objects in your uh, kind of this simple analysis that I've done and kind of graphs how they've kind of come together. So like these three things, this cities, uh, variable, the classes, and, the, and this vars thing came together to create this data. And then data was combined with this quasi Poisson function to create estimates. And then, you know, so, and the estimates were later created, used to create a, this effect in standard error. So, I mean, that's the kind of rough graph of how the analysis worked. Um, and so the idea is that, okay, well, someone might look at this and, and, they, and well, I, of course, you'd have to do some reading to figure out what exactly is going on here. But the idea was if you were interested in this and knowledgeable a little bit, you say, okay, well, I'm interested in this data object. You know, what, was, what went into cr the creation of that data object? And so the, uh, this object code function, you can grab the name of the object and it will show you the, sp the specific lines of code that were used to generate that. So, you know, if, if you have a file, there may be many lines of code, but only some of, um, subset of which were important to generating a specific object, right? And so, and so these specific lines, so it turns out it's just one through five, but these specific lines of codes were, 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 were what kind of created this data object, right? So there may be, may be di different types of objects uh, in, the, in the analysis, and you can kind of hone in on some of them and say, okay, what was the code that generated this um, object? Um, you can also execute the code uh, with, this, with the run code function. Um, and what it does is it, um, it, it, it runs the code, but it runs it in a way that it, just, it, that it just loads things from the database without actually executing code by default. So if you just kind of want to run it and see kind of some results at the end as a first cut, then it's not going to do everything from scratch for, by default. Um, and so, it, so it's a lot faster uh, on the first go. Um, but then, of course, things that don't, things that aren't stored in the database. So if you make a plot, you know, it's, gonna, it's still going to have to generate the plot because it's, that's not stored in the database. Um, but but by default, it just loads things, loads objects from the database to, to make things faster. Uh, you can of course force it to just run everything from scratch, um, and then it will just, you know, it will do all the calculations from scratch. But there may be, for example, there may be some expressions that you want to run from scratch, and some that you just want to load from the database because they're going to take, you know, they're going to take a long time. Uh, but in aren't that important, maybe. So the check code function uh, evaluates all the expressions from scratch, so it doesn't load anything from the database. It runs it all straight away. Um, and then the evaluations are checked against stored results. So the idea is that if, if a function creates an object, um, when the author created the package, the kind of signature for that object was stored, so that if you create the object again, it'll check the signatures to see if they match. Um, of course, you've got to set things like random number generator C so it's for this kind of thing to work. Um, uh, and, and then there's, there's another just kind of side function that checks the, each individual data object to see if you know any corruptions. It basically checks the signatures. Um, so um, you can load. So you can you can look at specific data objects. Um, and so you can, by, with this load cache function, so what the load cache does is, all, is it just loads loads pointers to specific data objects that are kind of that may be stored on a server or something like that. Um, and the idea is that once you want to, once you print something out to the screen or you want to make a plot, any time you access the object, it will transfer it from wherever it's coming from. So here it's, it's transferring 
from the cache database file, and then each object has a signature, and that's the signature. Uh, and, then it and then it shows you what it is. So once it's loaded into your system, it's loaded for good. You don't have to do it every single time, just the first time. And then these are just different things that you might want to look at um, uh, that, that are transferred from, the, from, a, from, from a server. So, um, so the summary, the basic idea of this package is that you can, authors can kind of create their, kind of, kind of package their analysis in some sense and then just give it to people. And then people can down, readers can download the analysis and look at you know look at specific objects or maybe rerun the whole thing. But there's some flexibility in terms of not having to kind of recreate the entire environment if it's a very complicated type of thing. Um, and so it's I try uh, the the goal one of the goals is to be mindful of other of readers' resources and to only kind of efficiently load things that are needed. Um, and so one of the things I'm trying to do here is create a, kind of like an archive for these types of reproducible analyses. Um, and so, and one goal is to be able to, to provide a space where people could kind of post these, re these reproduce these packages, these cacher packages, and to make them available uh, to other people. Kind of like a, it's almost like a like a, like a CRAN for or, or you know for um, uh, for reproducible analyses. It's like kind of a central uh, repository. Uh, this is not has not gone as quickly as I'd hoped, but hope, hopefully it'll kind of move ahead soon. Um, so that's kind of some of the software that I've developed. The other thing I wanted to talk about in the last kind of few minutes here is uh, my, is kind of, I wear a different hat here sometimes, which is I'm the associate editor for reproducible research at the journal Biostatistics, uh, which is a, as you might have guessed, a biostatistics journal. Uh, publishes mostly methodology, uh, statistical methodology, but also some kind of applications work too. Um, and so, what, you know, what, what, one thing that came up about three years ago, the editors you know, and I got together and said, you know, what can, what can journals do to make, uh, to kind of make published research uh, reproducible? Uh, and one of the questions uh, that we debated was, you know, should we take the kind of carrot approach or the stick approach, right? And so we kind of, uh, we settled on the carrot approach to try to kind of entice people to kind of work with us to make their published work reproducible. And so by statistics, um, so we published an editorial in the journal in 2009. Uh, kind of laying out what we thought the, what we, the policy was going to be and the rationale for it. And um, the basic idea is we, we kind of define three dimensions that we'll call dimensions of reproducibility. One is the data. And, and again, we, I, I call this the analytic data from which all the principal results were derived. Uh, and we need to, the idea is that if, if you, we can make this available on the journal's website. Um, the second dimension was the code. Uh, so any computer code, software, or you know, computer instructions that were used to, 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 um, to compute the published results. Um, um, and for software, that's kind of widely available. You don't need to give the whole thing. You know, if, you're, if you're using MATLAB, you don't need to give us MATLAB, obviously. So, um, but, um, but a reference you know, where, they can be, where it can be obtained. Um, and the last dimension, the idea was, was kind of combine these two things together. So we, I, we came up with this idea. Probably wasn't well. Anyway, I don't know what I was thinking, but um, the, the idea is that you know you could you could request uh, a kind of repro so the idea is that we would put these letters here. We would kind of stamp your paper if you made your data available. You would get a D, right? And if you made your code available, you get a C. And then if you made both your data and your code available, you get a D and a C, right? Um, and, th and then the last designation would be that if you made your code and your data avail uh, you gave your code and your data to the editor, the reproducible research editor. And he or she, right now it's he, um, would run your code on the data and try and reproduce the, the things that you published in the paper, so tables, figures, whatever it would be. Um, and um, and if I determine that those things match what you put in the paper, um, then I would kind of designate the paper as reproducible, and then you would get an R stamp. All right. So that was the kind of crazy idea. Um, and so these are kind of what the we call them kite marks. That's what they look like. So this one has a C uh, over here. Uh, there's really not much um, data in that one. Uh, and then there's uh, and then this one is an air pollution study. It got an R, so they gave us the data, which was publicly available, and um, and the code. And I ran the code. And, and 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 so the question is, well, what is reproducible? So this is one of the tables from that R paper um, that is uh, needs to be reproduced. So I check the results against this table. And right now, I just kind of do this by hand. It's uh, not as bad as it seems, but because you know, because so much pressure on space in the journals, you can't actually publish anything, right? So, uh, <laughs> so there's not much to verify. <laughs> um, but um, so anyway, so the idea is that we kind of I run the code, I try to generate, the, I see what happened, you know, whether these numbers can be generated, and in fact, it was. 
And there are you know, a couple other tables like this in the paper, and, and it, so it got the R. Um, uh, now, so what happens for a paper that, that for all, any of these papers, well, well, what happens is that you put everything on supplementary materials on the journal's website. And you can see it's not really ideal. You see that every file is called supplementary data. <laughs> uh, if you actually kind of hover over the link, you'll see that, okay, well, they're different actual file names. But um, the journal's website does leave quite a bit to, to, to be done. Um, and so, but that's kind of how it is right now. Uh, so there's relatively sparse data. This, I think this is a little bit old data, but I'm pretty sure. So there's four papers that have been requested, that have requested the R designation, and, and all four have gotten them. So we haven't had any problems yet so far, but not many people have asked for it. Um, and then a couple papers have gotten the C and the D, and, or both the D and the C. I think this is probably a little bit more than this, but not much more. Uh, and so um, I should say that the, I don't interact with people if they request the C, if, or if they, give their, if they submit their data or their code just kind of as is. I don't interact with people. We just trust that they've kind of done the right thing. If they ask for the R, that's when I kind of get physically involved. Um, Right, but it could have been hard. If they asked. Yeah. They didn't ask. Yeah. How, how many papers were submitted overall during this time period? So, uh, so this was a roughly year and a half time period. There's probably, uh, six, there's probably six issues. So um, I would say uh, maybe some, like 50 papers. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I would say 50 published. In terms of submitted, I can't tell you that. It's probably That's more fine. like. Is this published? These eleven are all published. These are all published. Okay. Yes. So I, one thing I should say, I didn't say this before, is that this a whole the whole reproducibility policy does not play is that, does not come into play in the submission process, right? So you can submit whatever paper you want. It will get peer reviewed in the usual way, and then if it's rejected, then we never hear from you again. If it's accepted, um, then. Um, you were kind of given the option of making your data or code. So it's not, it's, 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 it's definitely a back end type of approach. Uh, many journals that I've talked to, many journal editors I've talked to, are extremely concerned about reducing the number of submissions to their journal. They always want more submissions, right? So if you implement a policy that could, be, that could reduce the number of submissions to the journal, that's bad. So they don't want to do that. So we, from a first cut, we, uh, we did this in the back end. So, you know, we kind of talk, we work with authors and say, you know, can you make your data or code available? Yeah. Sorry, was there? Um, so does R implicitly mean C and D? Um, yes. Yeah. So yeah. So it could just be, it could have been like R C D or something, but we just left it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what what merits R? Because you only reproduce it at one point in time. That's a, yes, that's right. So it only comes along in five years' time, and the um, say Python's gone from two point six to two point seven. They've used a deprecated <coughs> or whatever. Then. Quite frankly, the R is a meaningless badge of honor. So it is very limited in the sense that we've used the software at this point in time, that whatever they use, um, and the environment that comes available at this point in time. Um, and we haven't you know, completely compiled, like, you know, like Andrew was saying, all of the different things that have gone on, the processor, things like that. Yeah. So, um, One suggestion? Yes. Why as an editor of the journal don't you have invited articles when you try to demonstrate best practices to educate the readers of the journal. So that, that is one possibility, yeah. We should do that, probably. Yeah. Uh, and what, what I'll actually have it on a slide later, is that this policy has not been particularly well advertised. Um, and and uh, I think there's a lot that we could do um, to kind of make it uh, bigger in some sense and more wildly, and kind of make it and increase its awareness. Um, so, um, I think it's common that you know, journal editors don't want to do anything that might bring down the number of submissions. But are there any exceptions to that? I mean, are there journals that are, you know, think about the, the top tier journals that don't really have that problem that you can sort of talk to about this kind of thing, where they're not really, I mean, are, is that, do you think everybody's sort of universally concerned about that? Oh, well, I don't know about everybody. But I, so, I have, so I've talked to at least one top tier medical journal where, um, they, were, where they specifically said we can't. You know, implement something. But so, so uh, uh, it's no secret. So this is the, the in the Annals of Internal Medicine. You know, it's one of the top three medical journals. Um, what they did do, though, is you know, a very minor step. But they did every article starting from I don't know when, maybe two years ago, has a statement that's called like the reproducibility statement. So every article has to say something about reproducibility, even if like 95% of them say nothing is available. They still have to say it. You know? 
And so, and then some articles say, you know, you can get the code from here, or you can email this person to get the code. So it's not a very big thing. But the idea is that you know that was as far as they could go at that time. Uh, but now they actually have some data, um, and they're planning on doing an analysis of kind of how many articles you know say different types of things, things like that. So yeah. yeah I want to also just make a quick comment on that point, which is I had a discussion with a uh, senior editor at Science, and I talked about these issues, and uh, he raised an interesting philosophical point, and they just have a different um, view on where in sort of the research vector reproducibility falls. And so this is very interesting in the sense that um, it's post-acceptance, but pre-publication. In some sense, it's getting verification. Yeah. And the science, the science editor said to me, um, reproducibility has always been something that's happened after publication. And it's always been something that the scientific community um, adheres to. So what we're going to do is put tools in place to do the reproducibility, but we're not going to do it ourselves. And so uh, you probably followed this that in February, science introduced the policy of requiring code as well as data to be released um, for all articles published February and forward. Uh, and the way they did it is you request it from the author, and then um, if the author is um, reluctant to give it to you or whatever, then you can get back to science, and science will then threaten retraction and so on until wow. the, the data is actually given to people who are requesting it. So they're very serious about it, but it's just that where they see this um, falling in the pipeline is just they've made a different demarcation. Yeah. And I would wager that most journals simply do not have or do not want to commit uh, the resources for doing what I'm doing. And certainly, you know, when I leave this position, it's not clear that what will happen. I mean, I'm volunteering my time here to do this. And, uh, and so, but I think it's interesting. So uh, one thing also about the R is that, you know, I don't, it may have been a little bit over the top to say R, it's reproducible. But I think the main idea here is, um, is this, to indicate to people that someone looked at it. <laughs> and rather than just like, you know, because there's many times where you see data and code, you get it, and then nothing corresponds, right? I mean, so someone actually looked at it and ran it, and it, at one time it actually worked. So, I, I mean, it's a very loose standard, but it's kind of what we've got. So, yeah. yeah. So you just reproduce, but not necessarily reproduce it in perpetuity. In perpetuity, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say about the, the um, journals, one of the, at least as I work with one of the journals, and basically what we see is one of the things in terms of submission is how much time does it take you before you get a decision. So the longer it takes you to get a decision, the less likely it is that you'll get more submissions. So if you introduce reproducibility in the whole reviewing process phase, that certainly will take more, without more tools, of course, that will take more time before you get an acceptance or a rejection. And because everyone is on this publisher parish kind of a track, the more time it takes you to get your paper accepted and then finally appearing, the less likely it is that you're going to be on that journal bandwagon to submit um, papers. So that's sort of one of the journals I'm working with, is that we've seen a decrease in number of submissions and probably if we, we've, we've improved our processes so that people can get their results a, a lot faster. Um, so that's sort of what we've been saying. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some art, some cases where you could argue that actually having the code and the data available would make the review faster. Uh, but I think in the large majority of cases, it, it would just it would slow things down. And so, um, but um, so, I, but I think it's it's a good point. And I think that, so. This our policy does not is that's why it's one of the reasons why it's not in the decision making process. It's after uh, this is, after this is, the decision's been made. Um, okay, I think that's. Uh, this is good, yeah. So um, um, and just a couple of things. I think we need a better system for kind of tracking. <laughs> you know, so one of the problems that we have is that we don't have like a, a, a system for tracking, you know, which the articles got which kite mark. So if I want to figure out what, what was the list of all the DE articles, then I, I kind of have to just click through. The, it's, not, it's not a great system that we have right now. Um, the uh, infrastructure for hosting data is very limited. So if someone come along, comes along with some huge genome study, you know, we can't host that data. But luckily for, certain, for that type of area, the ho there's other things for hosting data. Um, um, the infrastructure for, in general for reproducing results is very limited. Um, and I think we, we just need better advertising of this policy. And for example, so one of the limitations obviously is that, you know, um, we, in, ter in terms of getting the R kite mark, you know, I, we, it only has to be, it has to be the, the analysis has to be done using the <laughs> co uh, coincidentally R language. So if you have other software packages that you use, we, I just, we physically can't do that. Uh, luckily for biostatistics, most of the submissions you are anyway, so it doesn't seem to be a huge limitation, but who knows. Um, so just to summarize, um, I, you know, I think reproducible research is an important, as, as a minimum standard, uh, for, and, and particularly for studies that are difficult or, or impossible to replicate. Um, I think some infrastructure is needed for creating and in particular distributing 
reproducible documents uh, to others. Um, I just, I, so I presented the cashier package, which is one example that, we've, that I kind of developed to, to help in the distribution process. Um, I think critically, I think scientific culture in, in, in more areas than, some areas more than other, uh, needs to change, to evolve, to encourage greater kind of sharing of data sets and methods. And I do think that journals can play a, a key role in providing kind of carrots and sticks to authors. So one of the things about the biostatistic policy is that we tried to kind of have a positive reinforcement type of thing. So, we're, so articles would get these kite marks and they would be kind of indications of, you know, good things happening. Authors gave their data or their code. And so, you know, if there were, eventually, if you had a system where this kept going, if articles had no kite mark on them, you might wonder, well, you know, what's, what's different about that paper? Uh, it's not clear that we will have that effect, but that was kind of the original intention. So, um, uh, and I just want to acknowledge some of my collaborators uh, and the funding for most of this work came from NIH uh, and from the Health Effects Institute. So, thank you.